Proverbs chapter 3. Good to see everybody tonight. Proverbs chapter 3. That's the last time I'll say that for a long time. We'll be in chapter 4 next week. Been a journey, has it? Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27. There it says, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, Go and come again. Tomorrow I will give, when thou hast it by thee. Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Strive not with a man without cause, if he hath done thee no harm. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways. For the froward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. The wise shall inherit glory, Shame shall be the promotion of fools. You know, when we pray for wisdom, one of the one of the byproducts I'm searching for words here, but one of the byproducts of wisdom is we won't say foolish things. We won't do foolish things. Why? Because wisdom is the is the polar opposite. Of foolishness. So the wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. There's been times in my life when I was a fool, and I had to bear the shame of that. I don't want to be a fool. Amen. So I pray for wisdom. Let's go to the Lord one more time briefly. Father, we need your help tonight. Our dear brother Bill's already prayed for understanding. Lord, we do pray you open thou our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy word tonight. Help your preacher. We'll be grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've entitled the message tonight just simply General Instructions for Living Life. General Instructions for Living Life. And we pick up where we left off. And in the text before us, there are a series of brief but very important general instructions for living life and dealing with other people within our orb or our sphere of influence. Um, and my first thing I'd like to talk about tonight is what I call qualified benevolence. Qualified benevolence. And there again in verse 27, he said, withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again and tomorrow. I will give when thou hast it by thee. Qualified benevolence. He's speaking to ind individuals here, but the principle applies to us as a church as well. Now, what do you mean by qualified benevolence? Well, again, he says, withhold not good from them to whom it is due. That's a qualifier. Not everybody is worthy of, uh, of benevolence. Are we to give indiscriminately to every person that has their hand out? And the answer is, is no. Again, you'll notice that there's a qualifier attached to that verse. For example, there are people who are able to work. We know in America there's more jobs than there are people willing oh, yeah. to work. And so they're able to work, but they just, for whatever reason, uh, they won't. And the Apostle Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he said, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. And notice it wasn't a suggestion. He said, we've commanded you. Now, why so strong? Because 
When you and I feed people who are just too sorry or too lazy or whatever to work when they could work, we are enabling them to continue their bad behavior. I was watching an episode of a show called Intervention. Some of you may have seen it. I think it's on art. Oh, don't matter. But this shows about families who have drug addicts or alcoholics or whatever in the family and, and they're being offered a treatment to go to a treatment center somewhere. And, um, and so, and, and again, if you've seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Each family member has, has written a little letter that they were gonna read to this person. And uh, one of the things they all say is if you refuse this treatment, we are not going to enable you anymore. No more money for gas, no more money for car payments, no more, uh, you can't stay here anymore. In other words, we're talking about people who, who, who don't work. They, uh, again, that's called intervention, but same principle applies here from the word of God. And frankly, that's how welfare and other entitlements get way out of hand. The entitlements in, in this country. Um, I was, again, just recently, within the last three or four days, I saw uh, some kind of program where, Peter, probably the same program, in fact, I believe it was the same program, where all these people are getting benef welfare benefits, EBT cards, and they're selling them for pennies on the dollar so they can take the money to buy drugs. They're not interested in, in the food. And uh, so they fail, uh, so they can uh, sell it for pennies on the dollar so they can buy drugs and alcohol. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due. We have a responsibility to do a little investigation before we just hand out handouts. It's all a part of our responsibility as stewards of God's resources. Uh, you know that we are all stewards. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Amen. And the things that you and I have been entrusted with, we, are, we have been entrusted with those things as stewards. What is a steward? It's a manager of somebody else's property or assets. And so every, everything that you and I have, we are managing for God. It belongs to Him. Whether it's our home, whether it's our automobiles, whether it's our bank accounts, doesn't matter what it is, it all belongs to Him. And then again, as, as I said earlier, it applies to us as a church. How we, how we give out. You, you'd be surprised, maybe not, but you probably would be surprised how many people knock on my door uh, wanting a handout. Vagrants and I mean, any, for anything from gas to uh, to somewhere to stay. I mean, you know, want, want you to buy them a motel room. We've done that a lot, but uh, we don't give out money. Never ever do we give out money. We'll buy them something to eat. I, I don't know how many times I've went down to the grocery store and bought people something. You know, let them buy groceries and. How many times have been to the gas station and put gas in their automobile, but we don't give out money, never. And so uh, when a bona fide need comes to your attention and God has blessed you with the means to meet that need, he expects us to do that. And then verse 28, he said, uh, say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. You know, it's humiliating enough for someone who's truly down and out to, uh, to have to ask for help in the first place. And so God says, if you have it, give it. Just go ahead and give it. And of course, the Bible is full of promises. Again, I wouldn't give out money unless I knew the situation. And, uh, but if somebody's hungry, I used to keep uh, the 
Uh, Y'all know I love those Lent peanut butter crackers, which you cannot find anymore. Walmart's been out forever. Don't, don't go looking for them for me. I, I'm not trying. But I used to keep them in my vehicle, and I, I used to have to drive in Tampa quite a bit. And there'd be people, you know, with signs and uh, at, at the any time, every time you had to stop or at one of them exits off of the interstate, there'd be people standing there. And they'd come right up to your vehicle and I'd give them a pack of crackers, peanut butter crackers, you know. And, um, so, and again, the, the Bible is full of promises that say things like give and it shall be given unto you. And uh, Proverbs, I love Proverbs 19, 17 says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. Now, and when you give to the poor, according to that verse, you are in fact making a loan to God. And God goes, and it goes on to say, and that which he hath given, will he, talking about the Lord, pay him again. And that same theme is prevalent throughout the scripture from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Jesus said, uh, give and it shall be given unto you. And the fact is we just cannot outgive the Lord. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, the Bible says, cast thy bread upon the water for it, for you shall, for thou shalt find it after many days. In other words, whatever you give, it's coming back. And then I think verses uh, 29 and 30 are also pretty self-explanatory. There he says, devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Strive not with a man without cause, if he hath done thee no harm. Now, no doubt, probably at least half of us here, if not more, have had, have had trouble with a neighbor over the years. And, uh, well, that can be a, uh, that can be a, a real problem. He says, devise not evil against thy neighbor. That word evil comes from a Hebrew word meaning adversity, affliction, calamity, distress, grief, harm, whatever. Uh, I, when I was studying for this immediately, something came to my mind. Most of you know that uh, the Lord called me to preach out of the restaurant business and uh, our restaurant was at a busy intersection on the way to the beach and there was a restaurant right beside us and we lived we lived above our restaurant and they lived in a behind in, in a house that was connected to their restaurant so they had this um, waitress her name was Gloria she was the cutest little thing you've ever seen and everybody loved Gloria and uh Something happened where they had a little falling out. So Lori quit them and come to me and said, can I work for y'all at your restaurant? Well, I was just thrilled because she was a great waitress. And, uh, and then the owners of that restaurant next to me called me up and, and uh, he, the husband. Now they were acquaintances, not great friends, but acquaintances that I'd known forever. And he, I'm talking about neighbors now. He said, uh, we don't want you to hire Lori. I said, well, I'm going to hire her <laughs> anyway. And uh, he said, if you do, he said, your septic runs onto my property, their property behind my restaurant. He had bought that from the man I bought my restaurant from. This girl, this, uh, anyway, he says, if you hire Lori, I'm gonna make you dig up your septic line. And I'm just not the person to bow under that kind of threat. So I hired Lori and sure enough, that wound up uh, costing me, I don't know, a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars to have a new septic lines run behind that restaurant. But uh, again, but I never retaliated. And that's what this verse is talking about. Devise not evil against thy neighbor, 
Uh, and again, that word evil, adversity, affliction, calamity, distress. Now, that upset me what he did, but I never never retaliated in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And, and I think that's what the Lord is saying to us here. I, again, you know what? I'm, I'm talking about programs. I've seen programs where neighbors, multiple programs, you know, it's like, like that TV show Snapped, where, where a neighbor got mad at another next door neighbor and killed them. Eventually, over time, that, that uh, animosity got so bad that they actually murdered and, and did all kinds of horrible things. I, it's been a blessing to live here for uh, 16 years, with the exception, there's, there's one family over here that uh, they hadn't done it in a while, but usually about every Friday night, they'd have a party. And, uh, and uh, they're Latin people, nothing against them, but they, let, they like that music loud. <laughs> and, they, and, and, and I could hear it quite well in the house, right on up to 12, one o'clock in the morning, you know. So uh, neighbors can be a trying, a real trying situation. I was, I was uh, Harry Ironside was a great preacher. He was born in the 1800s, died around 1952, I believe. But he said this, he said, bad temper is always a sign of weakness. Bad temper is always a sign of weakness. A hasty spirit, but exalts folly and hinders the reception of what is right and true. Bad temper is always a sign of weakness. And so, again, this is a recurring theme throughout the Proverbs, talking about anger. And uh, he said, for example, he said, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. What does that mean? He's talking about people that get angry. You, you take away their fuel. In other words, just walk away. Don't, you know, it takes two to tango, right? We, we've all heard that. And, uh, you know, there are some people, even Christians, who uh, are just by nature confrontational. They like to scrap, you know. And uh, they'll scrap at the drop of a hat, and they'll drop the hat, you know. <laughs> and uh, some of the most, truly some of the most confrontational people I've ever known were Baptist people. <laughs> Just love to argue. God says, if they've not done you any harm, leave them alone. Uh, then in, in uh, verses 31, 32, he says, Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways, for the froward is abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. Envy thou not the oppressor, and choose none of his ways, for or because the froward. Who's the froward? That's, that word froward means stubbornly contrary. It means obstinate. It means disobedient. He said, he's an abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. Uh, what's his secret? Well, that word secret comes from a Hebrew word that's defined as a session by implication, a company of persons in close deliberation. Guess what we're doing here tonight, folks? We are a company of persons and we are discovering the secret of the Lord. Again, it said his secret is with the righteous. And that word secret also, uh, it says by implication, intimacy, secret counsel. Every day when you get alone in your secret place and know what Jesus told us to do, get in our closet and pray. And we get alone in our secret place, place and we open the word of God. We are discovering the secret of the Lord. And the Bible says his secret is with the righteous. Hey, people who 
don't know the Lord or even even save people who don't take the time to to get along with God. They never discover his secret. We all like secrets, don't we? What a wonderful secret it is when we discover the secrets of the Lord, when we have that intimate uh, communion with him, when he tells us things that are only certain people are, are find out about or are allowed to experience. And again, really and truly, why do we all gather here? Well, part of it's for this fellowship, but a big part of it is to discover the secrets of the Lord. That's why we open the Word of God every time we gather together and try to try to understand and discover the secrets of the Lord. And so he said, Envy thou not the oppressor. In other words, God said, Why would you envy somebody whom I find detestable? Someone who is slated for doom and destruction and damnation. When everything you could ever want in life is right there at your fingertips, why would you envy them? Intimacy with God, peace and joy and contentment, communion. An oppressor knows nothing about peace. The Bible says, There's no peace, saith my God, unto the wicked, none whatsoever. They know nothing about joy, they know nothing about contentment, they know nothing about communion with God. The only person he communes with is the flesh and the devil. There's nothing to envy. No joy there. And so, again, a perfect picture of the church. Then verse 34. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but giveth grace unto the lowly. A scorner is defined as one who mocks, ridicules, and laughs at. Why would someone do that? Why would someone mock, ridicule, or laugh at somebody else? Well, it's because they're proud. They're arrogant. They see themselves as better than that person they're laughing at. They see that person as better uh, they, in other words, they have an exalted opinion of themselves. A humble person, a lowly person, don't laugh at other people. They, uh, they're just the opposite. They're so preoccupied with dealing with their own shortcomings that they don't have time to busy themselves with somebody else's shortcomings, much less laugh and mock at them. And so the Bible says, surely he scored at the scorners, but he gives grace unto the lowly. You've heard me say it many times, that word lowly comes from a Greek word that, that's defined as not rising far above the ground. Why do we bow on our knees to pray? Those of us that can still do that. And I'm not one that can. But, uh, but bowing upon our knees and taking that low position of humility before God. Yeah. Approaching his throne with humility. Uh, he gives grace. The Bible says God resists the proud. But he gives grace unto the humble. Aren't you glad for that? God gives his unmerited favor unto the lowly. Verse 35, the wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. And we talked earlier uh, about the wise as opposed to the fool. You, uh, the wise shall inherit glory. That word glory comes from a Hebrew word defined as splendor, honor, again, as opposed to the public shame experienced by the fool. And I inadvertently skipped over a verse. I didn't want to skip over. Where is it? Let's see. Verse 33. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. Let's stop there for just a moment. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. You know, I grew up in a home 
where Christ was not the center. In fact, he, he had no part in our home, best I can tell. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a great place to grow up. Um, the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he blesses the habitation of the just. There's a big difference in the way the wicked live and the way the just. Live. Who the just? The, the, word, the word just always refers to saved people. The word just is a, is a legal term. It means to be declared innocent. When you and I trusted Christ as our Savior, he had take he took all of our sins, and you and I were declared innocent in the eyes of God forever. That's an, that's an unchanging, that's our standing. In the eyes of God, you and I are as pure as the driven snow. We've been born again. So he says, the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, the dwelling. It's a bad place to be. In the home of a, you name it, a drunk, a drug addict. Uh, my dad wasn't any of those things. But there was no Christ. There was just a, a, a pall, a cast of pall over the, it was just, the difference is night and day. If you've lived in a home without Christ, and then you've lived in a home with Christ, you know the difference. You don't need me to explain it to you, so I won't try anymore. But our, again, just uh, practical, uh, general instructions for living life. And I think we'll stop there. Come on up.